Okay, um, colleagues, I think let's start. And um, there's lots of people joining, but I think um, they'll catch up um, as we go. Um, as I've said, we have um, quite a big panel, um, so I uh, don't want to waste more time. Um, first of all, um, just to give a note that the session will be recorded um, and we'll probably put it up on a soon to be launched um, YouTube channel um, for all of these events. Um, Let's start by saying um, welcome to everyone. We have a really great turnout so far. 26 official attendees, six people um, in the queue joining, and, and 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 I predict many more. Um, so just um, um the usual ground rules. Um, I won't spend time on this. Um, if you're not speaking, um, please make sure that you are muted. Um, and um, um, switch off the um, um um your video um 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 when you are not when you are not speaking. Um, we have a very exciting um, afternoon ahead of us um, today. We have um, a diverse group of anthropologists um, working in many different fields. Um, we have people working in academic technologies, um, people working in mining, um, in government, um, and so many other spheres, um, as you'll learn shortly. I just want to say um, Luvuyo um, can only be here for an hour. Um, and so he'll leave um, in about an hour. He's not able to stay the whole duration of the time because he has other ministerial commitments um, to, to, to get to. Um, and Hemali um, will only be able to join after about an hour because um, she had another um, unexpected commitment. Um, so we have one person um, who can stay an hour and one person who will leave um, a little bit earlier on. Um, so just before we get to the panelists, um, as we say in this course, Indo uh, Ingabo, um, who um, we are gathered here to listen to, um, I want to ask um, Professor um, Joost Fontaine, um, who is the head of department at the Department of Anthropology and Development Studies, um, to just give um, the context to this event on anthropology in the world, um, and to give us a little bit of the history and the background behind this grouping of, of Gauteng anthropology, which as many of you would know by now, that is made up of um, UJ, UP, uh, VIDS, UNISA, and uh, more recently, Northwest University. Um, so without wasting any more time, um, I'll hand over to you, Joost, um, to just give us um, a five minute um, introduction to the session. Uh, thank you, Kobani. I hope you can all hear me well enough. I feel humbled by the collection of brilliant thinkers and engaged scholars that, we're, that I'm that gathered here today. Um, I'm really pleased to see this event going ahead, and I think it's going to be great. We've got a really nice lineup of people. Um, the background to the Gauteng Anthropology Group is goes something like this, at least this is how I see it. Um, I think there have been various efforts for quite some time to draw on the amazing collection of anthropologists we have working in the Gauteng region, right? We have, uh, Kobani just mentioned five universities, UNISA, Northwestern, Pretoria, Witz, and UJ. I mean, with all with anthropology departments and with uh, scholars and uh, activist scholars working in related disciplines and fields, I mean, that's an incredible concentration of, of intellectuals and scholars. And of course, as I think today's session also illustrates, there are loads of sort of anthropologists working out there in the real world beyond universities. And I think the core purpose of the Gauteng Anthropology Group, at least as I see it, is to provide a space and a context where all these great thinkers and, and doers can come together and pursue thorough intellectual debate, discussion, activities, events, reflection, uh, in order to promote intellectual growth and sharing. Because I think the reality of it is, is that universities, although universities are all about knowledge production, they are not always necessarily the best spaces for genuine intellectual growth and discussion and collaborative knowledge production. Uh, I think very often people who work in universities are inundated with uh, administrative demands and teaching and so on. And, and a lot of this uh, really doesn't necessarily foster the right kind of atmosphere for the kind of reflection and critical thinking and critical critical collaborations that genuine innovative intellectual rigor and uh, exploration demands. Uh, and and saying this, I come from the perspective that all people are intellectually engaged with the world, and that all intellectual activities and all knowledge production is always a collaborative effort. 
There's no such thing. Although often when we're writing our PhDs or our dissertations or we're doing our research, we feel like we're very isolated. Actually, we are always involved in many multiple ongoing conversations all the time. And this is, I think, the great advantage, the great excitement of intellectual endeavor is this collaborative collective aspect. And I think the purpose of the Gauteng group is to build on and to take advantage of this wonderful uh, gathering of expertise and knowledge and uh, intellectual work going on in the region, but also to, to play up on this collective aspect of knowledge production. And I, and I think, you know, in many respects, these, this kind of work takes place better in, in spaces between universities, between institutions. And that, I think, is what the Gauteng Group uh, is all about. And, and I think the fact that one of our first, I think it's probably our first big event, is one that is all about anthropology in the world, engaging with scholars who are out there doing stuff, is, is really pertinent to this larger aim. So that's really all I wanted to say. I'm very excited to see what goes on today and the discussions we have. And thank you all for coming coming along. And thank you to Kobani and everybody else who's been involved in organizing this. I think we're going to have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Yost, um, for that. And I think one of the two key words that um, um, really resonated with me from the, from that in beautiful introduction is really the collaboration the collaborativeness of, of, of knowledge production um, and knowledge growth, because sometimes we tend to work in, in silos um, from, it, from each other. I know certainly that the vision um, with this group um, of the GA is to really start to thinking, think about how do we um, collaborate with each other, not just anthropologists um, um, in the academy, but also um, anthropologists as we as we see today, um, working outside the context of mainstream, um, when mainstream acad academia so it's wonderful um, to, 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 to have this gathering as one of our first um, big um, events, not just between the institutions, but also within our colleagues um, working in all of these different from mining, um, life coaching, government, um, and so on. So without wasting any time, um, you're not here to listen to me. Um, I want to first um, start with um, Luvuyo, and I'm not going to do the clinical introductions where I read three paragraphs of someone's bio, but I'm actually the speakers um, the opportunity um, to, to share a little bit about their work and their journey um, with anthropologists and um, we've allocated about five um, to ten minutes um, for each speaker so without any uh, without wasting any more time I would like to welcome um, Luvuyo Jalisa um, who is a chief development expert um, in the Department of Water and Sanitation um, and I will um, allow you to um, 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 tell us more about your work in your own terms. So over to you, um, Luvuyo. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just turn on the video so that you can see me. Uh, I'll turn it off uh, in a bit uh, because I'm having a network problem. But yeah, you can you can see. So thank you for that, Tobane. Uh, as you've already alluded, uh, I'm a chief development expert at the National Department of Water and Sanitation. I have masters in environmental anthropology from the University of Johannesburg. And basically my job is to conduct uh, policy research, development and assessment. And uh, I've been involved in a number of projects including your hydropower policy, your mine water policy, your climate change policy, water quality strategy, <clears throat> norms and standards uh, relating to uh, water and sanitation services. And I also serve uh, in different uh, committees and, and panels. Uh, the first one was uh, the project steering committee uh, for climate change, clean energy and urban water in Africa. Uh, the SAD uh, Water Energy Food Nexus Committee. I'm also part of a task team uh, that is assessing uh, the implementation of the 2013 uh, National Water Policy Review. I'm also part of uh, the task team uh, responsible for the reviewing of the National Water Act and National uh, Water Services Act, which is uh, reporting directly to the minister, Lindy Sisulu. And I'm 
also the chair of a task team that is looking at uh, policy research on groundwater management and use uh, in South Africa. So you, you can see that uh, most of what I do uh, is within the legal and the scientific domain. Uh, and uh, as an environmental uh, anthropologist, and anthropology as a discipline uh, gave me an edge to try and understand these interactions between the humans and the environment. And what I bring on the table is uh, the uh, social aspect within this policy and legislative uh, uh, space. So uh, I also try because of my background in anthropology to recognize and strike a balance between uh, different goals, interests, needs of the people and also the environment and also address uh, complex interaction and feedback between humans and the natural systems. So the, the, the other example of the groundwork that I've been involved in uh, it has to do with the multiple use uh, of water services uh, that has been implemented in uh, six villages uh, by WRC, uh, International Water Management Institute, and also uh, the African Development Bank in Limbombo. Uh, six villages in Sekukune and three other villages in, in, in Vembe, where we are try, trying to look at the legislative framework that will support these villagers who are already supplying water to themselves without any need to apply for water use license. So uh, as an anthropologist within this field, uh, my job actually is to try and convince uh, uh, policy and legislative uh, makers that uh, the issue of access goes beyond bureaucratic processes put in place and that uh, whatever laws and policies that we come up with must be sensitive to the human aspects. So yeah, that's basically what I'm doing and how I'm applying the the anthropology knowledge in the current work that I'm doing. So thank you, Kovane. <laughs> That was short. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually perfect. Uh, fantastic. Um, um, thank you so much, um, um, Luvuyo, for that. Um, and I think, you know, I remember one of my professors um, when I was an undergrad um, um, was we were doing a case study of the World Bank. And one of the things that he shared um, was often the fear that um, organizations have of, of having anthropologists, particularly in government and multilateral institutions. And part of that fear comes from our understanding um, of needing to move beyond bureaucracy, which often characterizes government and multilateral institutions. So it's really important um, for us to see this work um, that you are doing and to see anthropologists represented in what is often seen as complex um, scientific issues that have to do with hydropower, um, water and sanitation, um, that are often thought to be beyond the social. And I think the beauty and contribution of your work is how much it brings us back that, um, um, that mm. all of these are not immune from the social. And I think especially now in the context of COVID-19, um, mm. that we see hints um, um, actually um, about the importance of looking at the human, animal, and, and human, animal, and environmental relationship because mm. there's no doubt that the next pandemic of sorts is going <laughs> in linked to the climate. So it's beautiful yeah. um, with this work and your intervention. And I think it leads us very nicely um, to, 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 to Dr. Karen Notier's work, um, who is a social and environmental anthropologist um, at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa. Um, and I have a very long bio from her, but I'm not going to Which read you're not going to read, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot um, so that you share, um, um, you share it in your own terms. So over to you, Dr. Notier. Uh, thank you. Um... So I hope I shared my video so that you can see. So uh, if you can see me, just say so. We can see you. <laughs> uh, brilliant. So I, I just wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me to the session because I think a lot of us anthropologists who are in the industry or outside the academia, 
you tend to feel quite isolated if you're not connected through these forums. And I think it's really important for us to, to be involved and, and connected in that way. Um, not only for our own sanity, but just to feel that connection with ecology again, you know, um, which I really do miss. So just um, so uh, you said the story of me. Um, so uh, undergrad at WITS, postgrad um, also at WITS, and then my PhD in environmental anthropology at UJ. Um, so I am an, uh, officially my title is senior researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Victoria. Um, but uh, I sit in a unit that they call Smart Places and also in a smaller unit called the Water Center. And I'm actually so glad that uh, you, you spoke first because a lot of what we do is it's the same stuff, guys. Um, and, and you can see how much it's also infiltrating the water sector and making it ours. So I, I'm very happy about that. <laughs> so um, I've been at the CSIR for about 14 years. Um, and there's two kinds of pro uh, projects that I do. So I'm a researcher, so we, we write proposals uh, about what we think is important for the country. Uh, that's interesting in terms of our own research. Um, um, experiences and expertise um, and generally it's in two areas so one is the design of technology um, processes and products but um, in terms of you know making sure that it's contextually relevant to the people that's going to use them so for example if we're looking at uh, implementing some sort of water initiative or technology for example in the district municipality then before you start uh, implementing technology you, that would employ me to go to the villages, go and speak to people to understand what are their actual needs. Because, you know, 14 years ago when I arrived at the CSIR, one of the big things was they have these very super technical projects. And then at the end of the project, they would have developed the fantastic technologies and processes. But no one would use it and they couldn't understand. You know, they were still of the opinion that Oh, we must just keep, give people more information. Then they'll understand why they need to use these technologies. Um, and that was one of the big things that I had to, you know, instill in, in the science I'm working with. That it's, people are not so easy. Just because, you know, um, you're also a person doesn't mean that you understand how communities work why people do the things they do or their relationships with the environment. Um, it's not just about right or wrong. Um, it's, there's a lot of stuff happening in between. So that's one of the areas that I get in, in, uh, involved a lot, is to make sure that uh, we do not create technologies, processes, and products that just sit somewhere on a shelf that no one wants to use, that, um, but that it really makes a difference in people's lives and that people are able to use it uh, within their own personal context. And then, of course, the other part of my job is to do research. Um, and uh, I work in a small group of other social scientists with some political scientists, uh, some international relations experts, one or two sociologists. But we're a very small unit. And we like to do research around uh, human behavior in terms of use, especially in urban areas. Um, we've done some interesting stuff on environmental migration. There's lots of interesting work happening at the moment where uh, the International Organization for Migration is now coming on board and, and saying, yes, people are influenced by environment and that is and, and climate change, and that's one of the driving factors why people are migrating. It's not just uh, political and, and you know, um, getting involved, making sure that we understand those drivers and, and factors that influence them. Um, so one of my biggest lessons, and if I can share this at the end of, of just this little journey, um, when I arrived at the CSIR, I thought I knew who I was as an anthropologist. But working in an in a organization such as this, outside of um, the, the, the warm embrace of other anthropologists, if I can put it like that, um, where you constantly are, are uh, questions why do you want to do something in a particular way? Why are you choosing to do focus groups rather than um, semi-structured interviews? Um, uh, you know, you have to prove that 
social science, anthropology, that there's rigor and uh, um, that it is it stands up to other disciplines, especially the more technical uh, disciplines. That is one thing that I really had to learn colleges to stand up for myself, to stand up for my discipline, and to know what is I bring to the table. Those specific skills that we as anthropologists have, and the way in which we are able to understand the world, I think it's hugely underrated by a, a lot of technical specialists. And I think and that's why I've stayed at the CSR for so long, is to make sure that we make a difference. Um, as you can hear, I'm very passionate about anthropology and about the work that I do. So, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Love, we, we, we love the passion. So please, uh, please, please don't stop. Um, thank you so much, um, um, Dr. Notier, for that. Um, that was really beautiful. And I think, you know, one of the key terms um, I actually had to, 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 to note it down that you used is, is this idea of contextually relevant. Um, technology, because we know that there have been so many stories of um, of solutions that have been designed in a very top down, um, um, aggressively top down form. Um, but when we find that when it's implemented at a local level, um, it's often technology that's not of relevance um, to that particular context. So I really love um, this idea, and I think one of the key words we always teach students uh, from first year onwards um, anthrop with anthropology is that anthropology is always contextually. Um, is always contextual. So it's wonderful to see um, how that plays out in a big picture um, um, at an organization such as the CSIR. Um, and I think, you know, one of the few things, I think less so in the African continent, but I, certainly in the global north, um, you can see that the ways in which um, even big tech um, like Facebook, Google, YouTube, and so on, have started to really value the, the contribution, not just of anthropology, but of social science. Because although they can deny this, I mean, although they can um, design these complex algorithms, one of the few things they've learned is that they still often, these algorithms don't tell them people's motivations. And so it's not surprising now that you see so many advertisements for Facebook looking for anthropologists or sociologists and so on. So it's really beautiful um, um, to see the work that you are doing and standing up for us um, with the big uh, <laughs> scientists. Um, thank you so much. Um, and now, in some ways, actually, that that your your talk also leads us um, wonderfully to 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 K2 Metso's work. Um, K2 Metso uh, Moloko is a talent management and compliance um, officer um, at the Northern Platinum Mine, and um, I'm I'm not gonna say much more about her. I'm gonna let her um, share her own journey and how she, um, um, particularly as a black woman um, um, in mining. Um, um, is using some of her background um, in anthropology um, in her own work. So, Kate Metz, over to you. Hi, Kate Metz. Um, okay, I think K2 might, might be having um, um, some tech problems. I'm going to WhatsApp her just now. But in the meantime, I'm going to put um, Hemali um, on the spot uh, because also your work um, 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 with the Centers for Academic Technologies has a lot of implications around really bringing in um, the social um, in some ways to, 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 to so-called um, big tech. So um, Hemali, can you share um, some of your... Um, 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 with, with how you've used your journey in some ways with anthropology and how it's led you to work in this field of academic technologies. All right. Good afternoon, um, colleagues and friends. I'm trying to share my video, but it doesn't allow me to for some reason. 
Um, but it's wonderful to see names that I know with people that I haven't spoken to, to in a very long time. Um, I'm going to share a slightly different experience because I've heard, I didn't hear Luvuya's presentation, but I heard um, Karen's presentation and she spoke about, I mean, I'm more of an applied role, an applied anthropologist role um, in, in, in her area of work. For me, it was a slightly different journey. I left um, um, the academic department teaching and lecturing in anthropology and then moved to the Center for Academic Technologies, and then I think I sent you the wrong um, um, bio um, because I am now at the Academic Development Center working in integrated student success. And initially, I didn't identify as an anthropologist applying anthropology within those areas. I just saw myself as still within within academia and learning new skills. But the more I, I reflect in, in this whole process of, of presenting today is taken me on a journey um, to think about how in what way have I applied anthropology and for me it I applied every day I guess every day in the way in which I think and I'm going to speak specifically to to something that I think is really key um, that I've really drawn on as an anthropologist and I in used to call it intuition and I had a conversation with Prof Tia Devet who many of you will know a few weeks ago and she said wait a minute you're not talking about intuition you're speaking actually about anticipation and I think as anthropologists, we have the ability to really reflect on the past, think about the current, but also anticipate the future in many ways. And in my current role, both when I was working in academic technologies as well as now in academic development, um, really anticipating what is coming or what's happening. And one of the things that 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 I have been thinking a lot about in my current role is, OK, this current COVID context. What does it mean for teaching and learning? What does it mean for supports? And this anticipation that we're able to, to, to um, um, do as anthropologists has enabled me to really think critically about the kind of projects that, that we're developing within, within ADC way before um, they, were, they were spoken about development. And I think um, um, also the ability, I mean, I know most South African institutions still teach, um, particularly the British social cultural anthropologists, but uh, anthropology. But I come from um, um, an anthropology training which which exposed me to the four fields. Now we did not have the typical American four field um, tradition, but we did get exposed um, through the different courses that we took: in paleology, archaeology. Um, I had a visual. Some exposure to visual anthropology as well as the social cultural work and this ability to to have various lenses to see the world i think is has enabled me to to work as an anthropologist with this holistic perspective um and and really think about the role of evidence the role of quantitative and the most of all the value of ethnography in in the work that we do um so i, I really want to just speak a little bit about you know the value I, i'm really happy when you asked me Obani, to speak at this at this at this um, forum today is really to think about um, the conversations that i've been having with some of the master students that i supervise about jobs and you know um you know entering the the world of work and the more I have conversations with them, the more I think about, you know, the the importance of the conversations that discussions that need to take place between institutions, academic de de departments, as well as as um, um, industry. And where can we find these uh, uh, synergies um, to think about um, how communication can be a vehicle between the institution and industry, but also to bridge um, gaps between practice inside and outside the university and to think more and more about how anthropologists can inform policy um, work more and more in, in policy and implementation i mean in the area that i'm in particularly in education i think the role of anthropologists is really well thinking about student success you know the way we trained um to think about student journeys to, to think about um, um communities or people from uh, from a bottom-up approach rather than that general sense of bureaucrat bureaucratic top-down approach that, that takes place in, in um, um, corporate or institutions as well. And then lastly, just a space to discuss the current and future of anthropology, which I think is a necessity not only for the development of 
anthropologists in industry, but also for the skills required um, for the world of work in this current changing context for our students um, in the current and near future. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, fantastic. Uh, that's clearly my favorite word for the day, fantastic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, um, uh, um, Himali, um, I really lo loved that and I love the, the focus on um, sort of this bottom-up approach and I think one of the thing, key things again that we often teach students early on um, in, in anthropology is really the importance of, of the individual, um, the individual matters um, um, in anthropology and we know that often top-down approach or certainly quantitative um, approaches to research often don't give us um, 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 that, 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 that don't often humanize um, um, the individual in that in that approach. So I really love um, this work that you are doing um, around communication and really using anthropology and ethnography um, um, to speak to industry, um, particularly industries that are often you know that were often thought of uh, as not being able to infiltrate um, as anthropologists. And so that does again um, link to um, um, Kate Metz's work. Um, Kate Metz, I've switched you to moderator now, um, so you should have all the same permissions as me. Um, are you able to, to, to speak now? Um, please make sure that you're not muted, um, Kate Metz. Okay, um, Kate Metz is reconnecting. Um, but in the meantime, let's move on to, 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 to Justin. And I think Justin's work um, is also so important um, 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 because while, when I watched um, your videos and how you use um, technology, particularly Instagram, I think it's also one of the th key things, again, linking to this, um, um, to, to this care of the individual that we have and that we prioritize in, 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 in anthropology. And I think your work, um, 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 particularly in, in, in caring for the soul, um, um, in well-being, um, the work you do with sapiens and sapiens um, does also tie to, so what happens, you know, once we've helped people get water, once we've shifted policy, um, mm -hmm. what, what happens at the individual level, what happens at the human, um, at the individual human level, and I think your work speaks to that, um, it moves us not just um, into the structural realm, but it also starts to think about how do we use anthropology um, to ensure the mental well-being um, 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 of, of people, and I think now again, I, I, again, I was reading an article um, a few months ago, and it was talking about how mental health is actually going to be the new pandemic um, um, post-COVID because um, um, of all the kinds of traumas um, in the world. And trauma, in its broadest sense, um, from economic violence, structural violence. Um, um, nationalization, exclusion, and so on. And I really think your work um, is really around starting to get us to think, how do we use anthropologists um, to not just tend to these structural issues, but to really care and tend to the to our, our souls and our own well-being. And so um, 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 without saying too much, I will hand over to you, Justin, um, and you can share your own um, work and experiences. Thank you very much, Tobani, for for the beautiful introduction. Um, my name is Justin Duncan. I am also a UJ alumnus. Um, I completed my master's, uh, at this point, I think it's two years ago now. Um, and I think throughout my throughout my, my career as a student at UJ, particularly once I became a postgraduate student, I sort of felt myself being drawn more towards the um, socio-spiritual aspect of anthropology. Um, and that was, I think, also facilitated by the fact that um, that was one of the, that was one of the, uh, it was one of the courses. It was part of our curriculum, speaking about spirituality and so forth. Um, but it was when I did my master's, I, f I focused on begging um, at different traffic intersections, robots. Um, in Johannesburg, that I started to really toy with this idea of what what does it mean to focus on your personal spiritual growth. Um, I was raised in a in a Catholic family. Uh, I would say that I renounced religion when I got to university and was introduced to um, critical thought. <laughs> um, but it somehow come full circle now. 
Um, and so it's not very interesting, or, or rather it's not very surprising to me um, that I'm starting to talk about these spiritual ideas. Um, but I was interested in uh, the ideas of agency and power and how agency is transformed into power um, through the correct uh, vehicle, through certain mechanisms. Um, and those mechanisms become available to human beings on the social level, on the cultural level. We all have this uh, biological agency, certain biological agencies. Um, and over time, through our social socialization, um, we're educated and we come to understand what the limits are of those agencies um, and also how far we can push them potentially beyond the limits um, and how that then translates into power. Um, and I'm incredibly thankful for anthropology because it's opened my mind in that way. I'd always imagined I would do psychology, um, but I found myself being drawn more towards anthropology, even though I was doing the two in tandem. Um, and I think what it is about anthropology is the incredible broad-mindedness, um, which I think along with this idea, uh, we we're talking about it earlier, um, cultural relativity. I think that there are many different ways of saying it, but it's essentially the, the idea of um, giving credence to things that are, that are different to ourselves and allowing it to unfold, um, allowing it to tell the story for itself. Um, and so that, that incredible tool that anthropology grants us as anthropologists um, gives us the opportunity to look at the world as it is and to accept it for what it is um, and to not cast judgments um, right off the bat, but to allow um, to allow the world, to allow systems within the world's uh, societies and cultures and so forth, um, to explain themselves to us. And then we can, you know, we can draw all these, um, we can intimate all of these things based on it. Uh, how I ended up doing um, what I'm doing now, I, I work as a life coach, um, which is one of the few things that I do. Um, I'm a life coach, but my business is called Sapiens and Sapiens. Um, and it's an anthropological firm uh, that is gearing research and design for the future of technology, essentially, so that humans remain relevant. <laughs> um, and I think that it, it's an incredibly uh, important field to start moving into now as anthropologists because of how open the future is. It seems to be very narrow in terms of the kind of conversations that um, that are being had around technology, robotics, and AI, and so forth. Um, and what those things mean for work, um, what those things mean for the relevance of, of humans. Um, and since they aren't really uh, in, in, in contemporary media and so forth, they aren't really these conversations around whether we should be pushing into these technological spaces, these spaces where robotics start to make humans redundant when it comes to certain menial, um, menial works, but also on the other end of it, highly specialized works. Um, since those are not conversations that are being readily had, I'm, I'm not really so sure about whether these conversations are being had within the academic spaces. Um, since I'm no longer working in the academic space, and I'm all sort of in the, the private space now. Um, it's important that there is a space in which those conversations are um, being fostered. And this is what Sapiens and Sapiens is about. What are the kinds of questions that we should be asking? as uh, hum humans, as part of humanity, as humanity, um, but particularly as anthropologists, because our work, our bread and butter, is the reality of humans, whether it's past, whether it's present, whether it's future. Um, that is our reality. That is the, the main reason why we do what we do. Um, and it's also the main reason why anthropologists um, think of anthropology as the most humanistic of sciences, um, that which humanizes the humanities. Um, so it's important that we have these questions, even though right now um, that's not that's not a, a very big reality. Um, in the future, it's most likely going to be because anthro as anthropologists, we look at the past. We're very focused on the past. We're highly interested in the past. And then um, we look at the future and we try and see what the correlation is between the two. How do these two realities, or these, these um, realities that are situated in space and time, converse with each other? And then in some way try and extrapolate um, and expound 
into the future what those things will will mean um and so with sapiens and sapiens the the life coaching Kogani, that you had mentioned um the videos that are put up on on um instagram those are conversations around ideas that seem to be spiritual but that are also quite logical psych psychological um and definitely very cultural ideas um and what is the importance of okay ac accepting that we are first and foremost biological organisms as human beings we are biological and the f the next level the level up from that is sociological because now we've got these biological organisms that come together and from being together um they form or we form a, a sociology and when we spend enough time around each other within that sociology we now develop culture and those three levels over there are um, important for how for how we question what it means then to live in a world that is changing as rapidly as it is um, and the spiritual idea somehow goes through all three of those levels um, and potentially for a long time we focused very heavily on religious thought which could have been limiting in some sense um, because we use religion as a vehicle to spirituality which it doesn't necessarily have to be oftentimes um, finding a deeper a deeper spiritual relationship with oneself requires going inward um, but recognizing that all of these these facets that make us human um, even on an individual level spirit and and mind and body those three things have to be in alignment um, and because of the world that we live in specifically because of the culture that um that we've been grown that we've been grown into or that we've grown from um tries to or has tried to historically separate a number of those um, facets um, into the individual components um, and humans now um, seem to struggle with um, with what it means to be a human because we're so spread um, we're not we're not holistic um, we are holes that have been separated um, and so with sapiens and sapiens i'm looking at it through logical lens I'm, I'm trying to understand through very deep questioning um, what it would mean what it would look like if um, we could start to start to bring these different things together and allow them to um, allow them to interact with one another um, and to allow that to to influence the kinds of questions and the kinds of conversations that we have um, so that's sort of uh, in a in a in a broad sense what what it is that I'm trying to do it's um if I could go just a little deeper for just a little longer <laughs> um sapiens and sapiens sapiens and sapiens is also it's it's a multifaceted um space like I said it's an anthropological firm um but it deals with many different things um I as a as a life coach that's one of the things that I, that we do with sapiens and sapiens but it focuses very heavily on on education um thinking about the kinds of questions that will be meaningful at some point in the future um, which speaks then to upskilling we're so afraid of of menial work or of just the kinds of work that we do right now being made redundant um, by the advancement of technology and so um, when we start thinking about upskilling we have to imagine what is the kind of work um, what is the kind of work that is going to be relevant in the future what what does that look like and, and then start to start to educate based on those um based on those deep questions um and then this is this is something that i've spoken to mali about um quite often which is how now do we take anthropology for the future and we could very well continue doing anthropology in the way that we did or in the way that um, our anthropological ancestors did where they they wrote about um in very romantic terms um cultures on in far flung ends of the earth um, or we could start thinking about what is relevant about business about the world and how does anthropology fit in there um, and so organizational management is something else that 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 sapiens and sapiens does um, so it's, it's quite broad um, but it focuses very heavily on anthropologists and um, we're currently looking at bringing in um, anthropologists so that we can we can expand the conversation and so that there are anthropological minds who are um who are thinking deeply and questioning and and hopefully something something broad coming coming out of it something applicable not just practical so uh yes thank you very much Kobani, for for the platform that you've provided I've, I've really enjoyed it so far 
Lovely, lovely. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Justin. For that. that was really um, um, lovely. Um, and I think it's always it's it's interesting to me that um, the 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 best selling genre um, um, in terms of books, not specifically in South Africa, but globally. You know, it's not all of these things that you, it's not novels, um, it's not biographies, but it's actually self-help books. And I think that that telling um, that, you know, even within um, this sort of fourth industrial revolution world and um, Facebook, Twitter, and all of these social networking sites, that in some ways the, the, the books that people invest in the most um, are, are books that in one form or another are going to move them forward. Um, and it was one of the most striking things that I observed as well when I first moved to Johannesburg two years ago. I'm very fascinated by the secondhand book market, and and essentially like 90% of the books um, 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 that I see in bookstores are primarily self-help books. And so it's really telling. Um, and I think the work that you are doing, particularly in AI, and us thinking about you know what are the kinds of questions, not just for the present, but for the future that we need to be asking. Um, because we can clearly see that with all of this technology that we have, which does, um, I mean, look at us now having this gathering here, so it's not all negative. But there is certainly, I think, a, a sense of um, 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 technology not always um, connecting us enough. And that's why you have all of these studies that show in many ways, um, with all of these social networking sites, that people are more lonelier than ever. So there is that tension around how do we use these con these these technologies um, to improve connection, to improve well-being, um, um, social spiritual, so social spiritual um, growth, um, and so on. And I think your work um, with Sapiens and Sapiens is um, is a contribution um, um, in the direction that moves us towards not just those questions, but ultimately um, 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 I would hope um, some kinds of solutions. So, um, Kate, are you able to speak now? Uh, Kate, Mette. So, on my side, I don't see any wrong. So, you are actually the moderator now. Um, okay. Is that you, Kate, Mette? Kate, Mette? So on my side, it shows that you're actually speaking, um, but I I don't hear anything. Um, and you are the moderator now, so you should have the same powers as me to be able to share video um, and audio. Can you check if your mic um, is on? So not just the one on the screen, but actually your laptop or your phone speaker that you're using. Or if you are using earphones, can you take them out um, and see if you can't... Um, Can you hear me? Okay, finally. Yes, yes, I can hear you now. But um, your connection is quite... Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we can hear you now. Perfect. Um, go ahead. I'm switching off my video. Yes, it's me. Hello? Yes, Kate Mets, so you can go ahead. We can hear you. Go ahead and, and, and talk. And... Yeah. But Max is... Can you hear me now? Can hear you, Kitmet. Hello. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. Um,
Hi, tu mete? Que tu mete? Hey, to meet Hi, yes, we can hear you. You can you can speak. Hey, to meet Tu mets ça? Ah, du coup, actually. Mm. Tu mets ça, we can hear you. Um, you can just continue to speak. Okay, uh, colleagues, um, in the interest of time, whilst um, um, I um, have no idea, I'm going to call um, Kate. Hello. Okay, can you hear me now, Kate? Yes, I can. Because um, I can see here, it shows that um, your experience is quite poor on your side. Um, so there is something wrong um, with the network. Um, but in the interest of time, um, And I'll I'll try to 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 I don't know what to do um at the moment I'll do some thinking, but um I would like to open it up for now um to 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 Q and A, so um you can just raise your hand um and feel free to um either make it comment um share your own experiences of um, um anthropology um or ask specific questions to um panelists or a particular panel. Um, that you were interested by, but basically, um, I want us to open to the Q and A, and then in that time, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'm, um, I'm not quite sure what to do because um, everything also on my side seems well, um, except, um, it, yeah. So, does anyone have any comments, um, questions, um, contributions that they want to make? No. No questions. If if I could maybe jump in here. Sure. Um, it's it's Karen speaking. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I've experienced a lot is that um. especially working in a more technical field um, and in the environmental sector. Uh, while there's a little bit more interest these days around technical issues and environmental issues from anthropology students, um, there's still a lot that can be done. And um, I, I really want to challenge um, universities and um, uh, staff at universities to, to maybe, you know, get anthropology students a bit more involved in, in that sector um, because, you know, especially where, I wor where I'm working, it's really difficult to get people to, um, with an anthropology background to engage on topics like water, the environment, um, and um, even though they, you know, I've tried to, you know, <laughs> Uh, supervise one or two students and, and bring them onto projects and that kind of thing. I really believe that there's more of a role that 
anthropologists can play in this sector. So I would really like to call on on uh, academic staff, but also students to you know to think a little bit more about what can anthropology bring and to to really delve into those issues and and make a contribution. Um, because I really think um, these big issues uh, that we're dealing with at the moment in terms of the, of the environment needs more anthropological thinking. Um, so definitely. Um, and also, I, I mean, I would be happy to also chat to people a little bit more um, about these things. So yeah, just some um, thoughts from my side. Thank you very much um, for that intervention, um, um, Karen. Um, and it links to the to the question um, by Motwana um, Mon, um, um, in the comment section, who says um, that there isn't much effort to recognize anthropologists as talent, um, especially outside um, academia. And they want to know um, to you for, to you all um, in the panel, um, do you have, you have in your experiences um, found that there is an effort to do so? Um, and he or she says um, that they were excited um, to hear from Kate Metze, particularly being a talent and management specialist. So I am on the phone um, with Kate Metze and we are trying to figure something out, um, but in the interest of moving along. Um, so when I'm muted, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really trying to get her, get her in. But um, if the I see also Hemali has, has a hand. So before we go to Montranda's um, question, um, over to you, Hemali. Thank you, thank you. I just want to, um, you know, continue with the that Corin's raising here, and I think we are in even more uncertain and strange times than we than we were previously in terms of unemployment in the job market, particularly in South Africa, and more and more people are losing their jobs, and they that also means that there's opportunities in time for the creation of new jobs, and I think anthropology really has an important space to play here. The role that we play and what we bring is is a little bit different to, to what exists in industry already. Now, I know, Karen, I've had this conversation with you before that I'm so frustrated that I don't see anthropologists being advertised, you know, a job for anthropologists. Exactly. I yes. know. And I think there's just one that I saw and I, I jumped with joy. It was so exciting. Um, but it, it, I think that's also the challenge. How are we packaging ourselves? If we say that I'm an anthropologist, people have assumptions up until today that anthropologists do certain things. You know? Maybe you can speak a little bit more to that or other panelists can speak more to that in terms of how do we package ourselves and can institutions, once they have students gradua graduating and are looking for jobs, can they not network better for those of us that are in industry, particularly situ situated as applied anthropologists like Karen and Luvuyo and um, um, Justin R, I guess. Lovely, lovely. Um, I see your hand, Justin. Over to you. Um, yes, these are these are incredibly important points. Um, as students, um, when we when we go into the university, we sort of we become children again, you know, um, and we rely so heavily on on these um, lectures, who are academics and who work within these spaces. Um, and so, if anything, academics are often gatekeepers. Um, whether whether they recognize it or not um, and so whether um, this may not be this may not be part of an academic's job um, but i would i would encourage academics to to consider um, playing an, more of an active role in that gatekeeping um, especially when it comes to when it comes to um, anthropologists i can't speak to the other fields um, but it's very difficult sometimes for anthropologists most of the time um, to find work um, as as the world of work evolves, um, and as businesses right now, um, we've got to focus inevitably on how to make those businesses um, more human centered, um, or sort of more humane. And that's where anthropology sort of comes in. But we don't know if business businesses are aware that that is what an anthropologist an anthropologist does. And so um, academics who work within these spaces, who have published and who are invited to symposiums um, to speak about these things, these are the kinds of individuals who have some kind of leverage um, and should start to have some more active role in, in, um, in helping to um, create, help a student create their career as an anthropologist 
um, and direct their, um, their thinking um, towards something that is uh, that's relevant for the world that we're in. Uh, but I, I, and since I don't work in academia, I don't I don't know how that would work. Um, for me, with sapiens and sapiens, very much love to start bringing young anthropologists with inquiring minds into into the fold, um, into my um, my business, and to start helping them um, craft the way that they think about. Um, anthropological issues, also to help bring out the um, mm. the inquire the inquiring minds, help fostering the growth, um, because I see it in in anthropology students. They they really want to to ask questions that are important. Um, some of the questions that are popping up in the chat already, those are the kinds of questions that we need: inquiring minds, critical thinking. I think that's foster. It's not, it's not just something that happens. Um, and it happens when you leave the academic space, um, when it becomes practical. So, yeah. Lovely. Lovely. Okay. Um, before we go to, to Karen, I, I see your hand. Um, I would, uh, okay, actually, let's go to Karen and then I'll read some of the comments um, that we have. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, <laughs> A lot of the time when I have to introduce myself in, in the areas where I work with, with the clients and um, other researchers, and I say that I'm an anthropologist, they, they say, oh, so you work with feet. Um, <laughs> and that has just oh made it very, very clear to me that people don't know what anthropology is about. Um, and it's also... You brought it back for me to the fact that as anthropologists, we need to understand what our skills are, understand the way that we think, what's valuable around that, and we need to be able to verbalize these things to other people in a way that they can understand it and in a way that they can also see the value that we bring. Um, I think though that's really important and it has to start you have to start talking about these things at university level um, you have to start talking about you know what skills uh, how do I apply this in a real world context it's one thing of applying my logical skills in an anthro on his paper or a master's and you know I'm doing my own little thing here but you need to be able to distinguish yourself and to say but what do I bring to the table um, and, I, uh, and my experience with anthropology students is, is that they, they're not able to verbalize that effectively. So that's um, one thing. Um, I also want to talk about, a little bit, I, I've seen now recently that um, user experience research are now adopting a lot of anthropological theory and methodology into what they now call is design thinking. Um, and this is where a lot of you see the, the Googles, the Apples, uh, even NASA, they are incorporating anthropologists onto their teams as part of their design thinking teams. So um, maybe, you know, for those people who are listening to this, go out and, and go and see uh, what those guys are doing because they're really applying the, the anthropological craft in different ways. Um, lovely, lovely. Um, sorry, give me <laughs> one minute. Okay, uh, let's just quickly go to the. Um, I'm sorry to have mispronounced your name, um, Moluandwa. Um, I wonder if you might, you don't want to sort of verbalize um, what you've written more than it being me reading it. I think it always adds um, an interesting dynamic. So um, I'll give you five seconds to decide. Do you want to hear your thoughts in your own words or do you want me to read um, out your comment? Molanda, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Um, just Molanda was continuing to say that um, um, personally, I think they observe that um, that this is a problem at the global south. Um, social scientists and anthropology PhDs are being hired in many big corporations such as Google and Facebook. Our assumptions way off. I'm assuming this is off in 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 the global south con context. Maybe they are, the, the way we are packaging ourselves is making us irrelevant. And I um, absolutely, I think that links to um, the points that um, other panelists were making. Um, Dr. A, do you want to ask your question yourself? Um, um, I know he was also experiencing um, network trouble, so I, I don't 
reading it. Um, Dr. Um, Andile is asking, um, hi, Karen, my question is on the possibilities if there are any um, of our departments to build relations with government departments in the private sector. Um, I would love to see our students um, getting involved in forensic work, for instance, or even in them working in cemeteries um, with government officials. Um, what advice would you give maybe in terms of internships within um, government departments? Um, okay, so there seems to be, sorry, um, before I go to you, Karen, um, there seems to be some issue with the participants not being able to unmute or to, to access their speaker and video. I'm going to look into the comments um, while, I mean, into the settings whilst, um, whilst Karen um, responds. So I think if you want to ask a question and you can't um, unmute yourself, just tell me and I'll move you to 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 moderate also uh, so that you 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 can you can ask that question. So if you want to ask this question, just tell me on the comment section and I'll give you moderator rights to be able to to unmute. Um because I always think it's much better um if you can articulate in your own words rather than someone um asking. Before we go to Karen, um I Malok um Ketumeta is trying to speak. Um um, are you winning, Kate Mete? Um, I think so, because I could hear everything so far. Fantastic. We hear you perfectly now. <laughs> Thank you so much. To you, Kate Mete. No, I actually just wanted to, to answer the, the question or add on to what Andili was Sorry to cut you, Kate, but before we, we get there, can you just share a little bit so that people have an idea of, of, of what you do? There was someone in the comments who was um, saying that they were especially excited to hear from you because you are actually in talent management at a, at a place that's often not known for hiring social scientists, which is a so I think those reflections uh, might be useful. And then you can go um, to the questions after. All right. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the platform. My name is Kidume Nzi. I did my undergrad with WITS and then my postgrad with UNISA. Um, I've been in HR for 10 years, purely in the mining industry. And I serve in the SABPP as an HR profession for learning and development. And I sit on the Education Advisory Committee, which is under the Minerals Council of South Africa, formerly known as the Chamber of Mines. And I've, so I've worked with different companies within the mining sector. Um, so commodities such as Andalusite, um, uh, Bentonite, Cement, and now I'm in the in the platinum in the platinum sector so my role or rather my current role um, involves a lot of hrd so that includes learnerships bursaries um, internships or other graduate programs and internal and external training and then i also look at career and succession planning in the organization and that includes um, individual development plans, performance management, and how you would move one person into another level, another higher level into the career, and how to assist employees to develop themselves career-wise within the organization or wherever they would want to go. Um, I also look at Um, reporting bid in through the mining charter or it all has reports to the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. And I also look at um, internal auditing on the HR side. So that's basically a sum of, 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 of what I'm responsible for currently. 
Um, I think if I should throw a little bit of um, anthropology in what I do is that I think it puts me in a better position because I tend to question everything and I not only question everything for the sake of uh, just questioning it, it's a matter of questioning it to understand how things are being done and to identify if they could be done better. So to, for example, to reduce the, the, the time so that, because in the mining sector, we're more focused on, on production and safety. So if production can come out and if it can be done in a more safer way, so it's always better. So if these two things are covered for me, then it makes my job easier. And I'm more of a socialist and most people would know that in HR, uh, people tend to be working in silos. So they would lock themselves up in offices. Uh, they're more rigid. So for me, I, I'm more of an open person. I'm an, I work, I believe in open door policies and I'm, I tend to be connecting more with employees um, if I compare myself with other HR personnel. So that's a brief summary of, of where I am and what I'm doing and how I'm using anthropology in, in, the, in the mining industry. Fantastic. We can hear you very clear now, um, and I'm sorry for, for, for all the technical difficulties. Okay, did you want to also go to the one that you wanted to respond to uh, before I, I go to the, to, the, to the other comment? Yeah, I wanted to add, actually, to what Andile was saying about um, how uh, there could be a sort of a collab between private sector and government and so forth. I think there's a... I don't know if I can say a, a shortage or a lack of uh, understanding with what anthropology is all about, but I, I would say, I would throw it to the institutions to say that it would be nice to have um, social science students also have the opportunity to do vacation work, because for us in the private sector, it's more easy, if I can put it, for a, a student to come forward to say that I'm from X university and I need exposure. I'm busy with this project. I need exposure with X, Y, and Z. So for us, it's more easier to assist them in that way when it comes from the student through the institution, then we can help. But what I would put to the institution to say, uh, to say is that because of the the scarcity of jobs in the country, you wouldn't really want to make it a compulsory thing, but to say to the students that um, if you are able to do such a thing, go for it, look for an organization that is willing to assist. And then I think in that way, it, it gives them an opportunity to see what is in there, in the private, be it in government or in the private sector, and then for, for also for the institutions to be educated about what is anthropology and how it can assist organizations. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, um, Katie Metze. Um, Justin, you've had your hand up um, for a bit. Yes, um, I actually wanted to draw on what both Katie Metze and, and um, Karen has said, um, or they alluded to. Um, which is the importance of um, anthropology as a field of study to shift um, its gaze. Um, because we, we tend to, when we learn anthropology, we tend to get stuck in the, um, the traditional sociocultural thinking of anthropology, the romantic idea of getting on a ship and sailing across the ocean writing about the traditional peoples and so forth. Um, but the world is shifting in such a, in such a, a drastic way. Um, and so it falls to the, it falls to the educators um, and those who structure curriculums to start thinking, how is it that anthropology um, can shift its gaze? How is it that we can um, arm students with the kind of knowledge um, that'll 
allow them to start thinking critically about the world as it is evolving. And um, Karen had spoken about um, UX design, user experience design. Um, I'm doing some work with that at the moment with, uh, with Himali, in fact. Um, and it's highly anthropological, even though those spaces, user design spaces, may not be aware of how anthropological it is, the thinking that goes into it is incredibly anthropological because you've got to consider um, who your target audience is and then how do they think culturally. So what is the expectation from the, the media that they interact with? And when you do that and you start to create a website around that, you recognize that the website has to speak to their cultural understanding of what the technology should do, um, what the kind of media that they are that they are um, introduced to um, tells them or how it's presented. And those are very anthropological questions. Um, so the fear that, um, that robots or AI may take our work is, in some senses, it's a legitimate fear, but What's legitimate about it is that it'll take the work as we know it right now and force it to change. But there'll be loads of opportunities in the future. And this is where anthropology becomes incredibly powerful and incredibly empowering because we are able to look at the past and not present now and then extrapolate. We're able to look into the future and imagine what things might start to do and then prepare for it, which is why I was saying earlier that upskilling is so, um, it's so powerful. Um, and so then once again, to reiterate, it falls to the educators, those who are structuring the, the curriculum now, to start gently forcing anthropology um, into newer spaces where our anthropological thinking is not so much focused on the past anymore as a, as a, a romantic reminder, but rather on um, how we know about the past and about the present can prepare us so that we start asking relevant questions and we start helping to facilitate the movement and the growth of, of culture and possibly technology into the future. Um, so any anthropology students right now who are listening to this, um, it, it, also becomes, it also becomes your responsibility um, to start thinking critically about how you are use all of the resources that are available to you if you don't already and start, start crafting your questioning around um, the current world that we live in and where it's where it's headed that was all i wanted to add absolutely um thank you very much um for the, for for that justin um i see your hand um Ketu Metz, i'll come to you now um prep um everyone i'm going to um allow just one more round um of questions and then i'm going to ask the panelists uh to to sort of close us off um with last sort of reflective thought um, and i want to just um put um um, Yost on the spot because um, I think we've focused a lot in the conversation and, and rightfully so um, on sort of really taking anthropologists into more STEM focused um, um, industries. But as someone who's also worked um, a lot with creatives, artists, um, and so on um, outside of the outside and within the academy, um, I think it would be so wonderful to hear um, reflections also around that. Because um, it's not only in corporate that we're aiming for, but how do we use anthropologists in our creativity, in music, in art, in painting, and, and so on. So um, um, it would be wonderful, um, Yost, if you get some reflections on your experiences, particularly in Nairobi. And then um, if anyone has um, any last burning questions, we'll take them now. And then the panelists, um, you can just start preparing yourselves mentally for your, for your last closing thoughts and then um, we'll move to that. Um, okay, um, Ketu Metsa, you had your hand up. Sorry, it was a mistake. I didn't put it down <laughs> initially. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, okay, there's someone with a hand up. Let me try to give you um, 18017. Um, try to see if you, um, if you want to, if you, you are able to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Well, oh, okay. Um, my name is Precious. So um I'm having a question here because um based on what has been wrestled with in this session, um I kind of have questions with regards to fundings because I'm one student that is interested in um, furthering my post 
graduate studies in anthropology. So I wanted to know, apart from the NRF funding scheme, are there any alternative funding schemes that are available for postgraduate studies? Okay, fantastic. Um, let's let's flag that. So the panelists have heard um, Precious's um, comment, um, and let me just say Precious is currently the top student in third year um, anthropology at UJ at the moment. So um, I'm definitely a student with uh, with fun funding. Um, um, but um, I'll give the panelists some time to think, and I see Yost, um, you said you're ready. Um, go to Yost, and then any other last comments, and then before we we, we move towards the club. Okay, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? Uh, perfectly. Okay, great. Quickly, to answer Precious, uh, it's lovely that you're taking part in this conversation. Um, having come from the UK a couple of years ago via Nairobi, I'm always surprised how much money there is available for postgraduate study actually at UJ and other universities. So I would encourage you to keep looking. I mean, there are things like student, uh, supervisor link bursaries and so on. And, and I actually think if you're determined and really ready to look and ready to push people in the faculty and push every button that's available, you will get funding. It, it is out there. And if you are a top student, I think you can be pretty confident that if you try hard enough, you'll get it. So keep pushing. Um, but anyway, uh, Kobani asked me to say something about collaborations with artists. When I was fortunate enough to live in Nairobi and work as, at a research institute there for a couple of years, um, between 2014 and 2018, I find myself um, working with a lot of artists and I kind of fell into this because what I realized was that in Nairobi, the most exciting intellectual work was being done by artists. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, there are brilliant academics and there are great universities there, but I found that the, a lot of the universities are, are, are battling under huge problems, much more than in South Africa, actually, to do with numbers of students and, and so on, so that it, it, the intellectual environment feels very stifled in a lot of universities, not all of them, but in many. And this is, was a stark contrast to what I found amongst the artists. And I read artists here in a very broad sense, so I would include visual artists, performance artists, uh, sculptors, but also writers. There's a great writing scene in Nairobi. And so I, I kind of naturally gravitated towards uh, the scene, and, and I, I was really astonished by the amount of work that they were doing, and it, and it made me think quite hard about the kind of collaborations that scholars and artists can do. And and many of you will realise that this is quite a trendy thing. There's a lot being written about this, and big funding, international funders are often increasingly saying, you know, uh, are you engaging with artists? How are you doing? And so on. And very often, what I find is that the funders tend to put collaborations between scholars and artists under the sort of dissemination section of a funding application. And I think that is fundamentally wrong. Because what that does is it kind of says, oh, we have to work with artists because artists speak to a different crowd. And we can work with artists in order to get our knowledge out to other artists, uh, to other people. And actually, I think that is diminutive. I think it undermines and it undervalues uh, the, uh, the great contribution to intellectual work that artists do. And this is very much what I was thinking when I was in Nairobi. And so I started working with, with artists and we did a whole series of exhibitions and all around the theme of remains, ways and autonomy. And I found this totally exhilarating. And one of the, and I spent a lot of time you know, doing the work. It's, it's a lot of fun putting up exhibitions and curating is so much fun. It really is. But it's also intellectually simulating because what the conclusion I kind of came to was that academic knowledge production in kind of university formats and writing peer review journals and all of that tends to be very formulaic and tends to work towards closure. So if you think of the shape of an academic article, for example, which we all read, you know, the introduction will probably throw out, look, this is, you know, here's a, uh, an anecdote. This is why it's relevant. Then it will open up a discussion around something usually quite theoretical. Then it will discuss a whole load of an ethnographic material. And then at the end, it closes it down. So this, I think, is a very common shape of, of anthropological and other scholarly work. It tends to open up and then close down. And what I realized that the artists are doing is, is almost the inverse of this. 
that they don't close anything down. They open it up. And they open it up in ways that isn't just about an issue that's being discussed, but also in how it's being discussed. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the difference between metaphor and metonym. So the difference between, say, language and an image. And what I, I kind of realized and what I think anthropologists are particularly well suited to this kind of engagement is that artists are often, especially visual artists who I spend a lot of time with, but also performance artists and writers, but particularly maybe the visual artists, they're doing intellectual work with images or with sound. And this is why artists quite often would say uh, they're quite reticent about necessarily writing a summary. You know, you have an exhibition and then there'll be like a little caption. Artists have a lot of problems with those captions. And a lot of the artists I know would just say untitled. And the reason they say untitled is because I'm not going to write about my work. My work is my articulation. And if we push forward with this, we can think about how we could do intellectual work that is not necessarily limited to language. How we can explore experiences, um, life worlds through metonymic means, metonymic means, which are not reduced or constrained by language. And I think that is something that uh, all scholarship could learn an awful lot from. Uh, but I also think that anthropologists, maybe because the question of knowledge production has always been at the heart of an anthropological inquiry, right? It's not that anthropologists somehow use a method and get different, different knowledge than other people. We do do that. But it's, anthropology is also about constantly reflecting upon the very nature of knowledge and of the knowledge that we are producing, that we're engaging, that we're generating, that we're encountering in the world. And that's why I think anthropology artist collaborations are particularly fruitful. And I would encourage all of you, if you have the opportunity, to work with artists and to really think about these things around how, what is knowledge? And is knowledge only a, a factor of language? Or can we think about knowledge and intellectual work that takes place through the senses, through images through smell through sound and that really is what my experience of working with artists and that's why i find working with artists so in, invigorating and so exciting i think i think i'll stop there fantastic no thank you very much um your time. i mean in, in my own experience as well when i think about the work i've done outside of the academy one of the most meaningful work i did was to work on mass communication programs so working with um, people who create television programs, but using research that we do as anthropologists, whether it's on sexual socialization and so on, and working with creatives um, to tell those stories in ways that entertain, but also educate people um, about um, condom usage, multiple concurrent partnerships. And I thought it was one of the most um, fascinating I think it shows the depth of what also you can do with anthropology when you work um, 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 not just within mainstream academy, but that the kind of reach and and depth that one can can attain. Okay, um, I see uh, Marike has a hand. Um, so Marike, hey guys, uh, thank you that I could join the seminar. Um, just something about art. I also think it's really interesting just because it enables, I think it was Duncan who spoke about like people interacting with the past and the present and um, people being caught up in different times and spaces. And I think art is another medium of how people can converse with each other um, and explore different times and different periods of history and different people. So that was just like a, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Marika. Um, before I give the panelists time to reflect, um, is there anyone with a burning question? Because I want to use this time to also um, allow the panelists to be able to offer their, their closing thoughts. So um, we were allocated um, two hours, but it doesn't always mean we have to use um, that two hours. So is there any last burning thought from the floor before the panelists um, um, offer their concluding thoughts? Okay, Precious, I see you. Um, anyone else? Okay, Precious, and then um, um, 
yeah, um, we'll see the order in which the, the panelists will go. Okay, Precious, over to you. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for the platform. So um, I was thinking, because um, I came across this link on social media. So um, among my peers and colleagues that are also doing anthropology, um, I've come across some people that are interested in progressing with their postgraduate studies in anthropology. But now, um, what I was thinking, um, specifically I'm directing this to Dr. Gobani, Dr. Just Fontaine, and um, is it Shane? I'm not so sure about that. So um, is it possible for you guys to kind of open another initiative um, so that um, other students can get access to this platform and get to hear more about this field and what they are entitling themselves into for them to get a broader understanding of what is really happening in the field and everything. Okay, thank you, Precious. Um, noted. Okay, um, so I'll just go in, in, in the order I have here. Um, so I'll let Kate Metzer go first. So Kate Metzer, you can respond to whatever you want to respond to also offer your last um, sort of closing remarks and then I'll sort of go down um, the list as, as, as it's shown to me. Um, I would just like to say that one thing I learned about Anthro in my varsity days was that the beauty of it is that uh, because I know that students often worry especially Anthro students they always worry about where am I going to work after my studies and so forth so the beauty of it is that you can really work anywhere and you can do anything well, except in the in the technical sphere of it, or like doing medicine or finance or in engineering and so forth. So I think if one presents themselves well, they are out there and they are not shy to educate people about what Anthro is about, even employers, because there are still some employers that really don't know what Anthro is. Uh, I think I was lucky because when I got into mining and when I got into HR, I was fortunate that the person that gave me that opportunity should be out there, the, the students should be out there and really they really want to do anything that they want to do. And they should not be afraid of talking about what anthropology is all about. So yeah, that's that's my my last thoughts. Thank you so much, um Kate Metze. Um Hemali, you are next on my list. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I think one of the mo the question that was raised the most here was about, you know, bursaries and, you know, opportunities for the future. And Precious, I just want to um, highlight that there are many opportunities within the Faculty of Humanities in terms of funding. Um, I think um, I could be mistaken, but my colleagues from anthropology can just confirm. I think it's Dr. G uh, Gastro, Claudio Gastro from the anthropology department, who um, um, oversees the the master's um, applications. I'm not sure who does honors, but they would be um, in, in a better position to advise you in terms of faculty studies. And then I've also shared um, the uh, postgraduate funding um, booklet in, in the chat as well. So for students from UJ, please access that. And students from outside of UJ, I think there might be um, information about NRF and more national wide Funding, uh, funding opportunities. But in closing, I just want to just reflect on the context that we're in. And one which is on post truth, um, and I think technology, they are narrative, utopian as well as dystopian narratives um, of technology. One that spells doom and gloom, and the other that identifies varied opportunities that, that um, technology can create. A few months ago, I was driving from campus to campus. Or meetings with different lecturers and, and so forth and now the COVID pandemic and you know the, the lockdown and having working from home has just made us realize that technology 
should we have the access? I know there's the question about about and access to resources enables us to to connect from from different campuses and not have to you know spend that extra time and money in petrol and driving up and down associated with that. So back to the the question on technology and, and, and AI. I mean. We, they, they, there's a lot going on um, in, in that space and technology is somewhat and even more so now become at the forefront of, of conversations of where humanity is going. And I just want to highlight that more than ever before, we need to remember that be, behind technology, there are humans. And as anthropologists, we can engage in the conversation that is important, the most important, and that is about ethics and morality of the use of technology um, um, in, in human um, everyday social life. And I just want to leave on that note because, I mean, it's a huge note and I know it's something that can, could be discussed um, a lot further, but there is opportunity now for us to rethink the way in which we, we, we work and apply ourselves as anthropologists. Karen, um, um, Kitimetso, Justin have alluded to some of those, those, those potentials. But I also think, and I think someone raised in the chat about us as, um, as anthropologists and you know we need to let industry see and hear us and I think we're slightly mistaken if we're demanding industry to see and hear us I think we also need to rethink the way in which we package ourselves and I think um, the institution is doing a wonderful job in in anthropological academic spaces in 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 um, applying thinking about how we apply classical theory into thinking about present, um, um, the, the, the past, present and future of humanity. But also, we need to think about how do we apply ourselves and package ourselves for as anthropologists for um, um, these applied spaces, whether it's in the medical field or environment or arts and, and so forth. So yeah, a long reflection, but <laughs> those are my words. Thank you. Lovely, lovely. Thank you, um, um, Himali. Um, let's see who's next. Um, Justin, you are next on my list. All right. Um, I think so. I don't necessarily want to add anything new. Um, other than, I guess, just to reiterate that um, anthropologists have incredibly fascinating jobs. <laughs> um, I love my work. I love being an anthropologist. I love creating the world before me, creating my career as I go. Um, and because I'm, I have the tools to think um, culturally, it helps me um, to create the world that I see in ways that are meaningful. Um, I do think that as anthropologists who are now starting to make um, inroads, um, anthropologists who are crafting careers for themselves, that we um, we have a responsibility to those students, um, especially at the universities that we've come from, to help them to understand what they can do. Because um, most students tend to do things that um, make it easy to walk into a job. It's law or medicine, or, um, psychology, you know, things that, that have um, some sort of security about it. Um, but it can also be very easy to when you when when you've studied something like that and you've moved in into those spaces to not necessarily do anything more um, because the work is laid out for you um, and the salary is is consistent and so forth. Um, and what's fantastic about anthropology is that you do your best anthropological work when you are willing to think critically about the world around you. And as South Africans, we live in a country that is. Um, it's marred by all sorts of problems. Um, and anthropologists are, are the kinds of people who have the thinking um, that would go a long way towards firstly questioning what is exactly wrong with, with the current structure and how we can then start to um, fix it or move towards, towards a place where things operate better for all. Um, so I think that anthropology will continue to remain relevant. Anthropology will start to become more relevant as we move forward, um, especially because of how the world is becoming this virtual reality. Um, and we now no longer have these tangible artifacts 
um, that, you know, tactile artifacts. Um, but we now started to create this virtual environment where um, the, we're trying to take the reality as we understand it in the natural world and um, expecting to see the same thing online. But it doesn't always translate. And this is where anthropologists come in, whether it's, it's pulling it apart and starting to understand it more or to the conversation so that we can start to create things that are um, suited to humans. Um, so though our students are having a hard time imagining what, what is the kind of work that they'd be able to do, I think that um, moving into the future, there's going to be loads of interesting work, but our students also have to take responsibility for their own education. It's not enough just to go to university anymore and, and to have the lecture um, teach you. Our students need to take their the education seriously. I wish that I had had um, this understanding when I was a student. Um, I wish that I had had access to, to the infinite resources that are available um, on YouTube, um, the free courses that you'll find on Udemy. Even on the UN, the UN has, um, it's called, I think it's called UNCC Learn or eLearn, um, and it's got loads of free courses. Um, the UN is often is often one of the uh, one of the employers of anthropologists, which makes sense. So, so our students should should take their learning, um, take responsibility for their learning beyond the university and upskill. This is your currency for the future. Um, so I, I think that that was all I wanted to add. And once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself, Kobani. Thank you. Thank you, um, Justin. Um, and I have noted um, in the comment section, so if there are any students here who want to connect with um, particular panelists, so um, all the panelists except you, Justin, <laughs> have put up their emails um, in the comment section. So make sure you get um, those emails before um, the session ends. Um, okay, Karen, you have the big responsibility of closing us off. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, also from my side, thank you so much. It's really nice to catch up with uh, other anthropologists. And and in particular, I'm very happy to see that scouting anthropologists are, are engaging and doing things. And um, for many years, anthropology in South Africa has been dominated by uh, particular universities, especially those universities in the Cape. I'm not naming any in universities, but I am like, yeah, man, how thing, let's go. Let's show them what we can do. Um, I have uh, put some links in the chat for uh, funding, but um, also you need to understand how funding works in, in many of these organizations. Go and familiarize yourself with what they want, what's expected, um, and start working on your CDs as well. Um, start working on uh, getting an understanding of yourself and where you would like to go with, with your anthropology. I think that's really important. Um, then, uh, you know, for me as an anthropologist, I believe that we are ideally situated to contribute to finding solutions to those great challenges of our time. And I think we really need to to play an important role there. Um, and especially, I, I think it's really, really, really important for anthropologists from Africa and South Africa to have our voices heard. Uh, we have um, significant lives. We have um, contributions that we can make that only comes from an African context. And the world needs to learn more about what we can contribute to these conversations. So I really want to encourage students to get out there, talk about anthropology in Africa and, and, and what we bring. And then lastly, Justin, it was so nice because you were saying you love being, anthrop being an anthropologist. Well, so do I. I love being anthropologist because it's not just a job. For me, it has always been a way of life and a way of engaging with the world. And, and honestly, I found that with a lot of other anthropologists. It's not just about another job. It's really about who we are. Um, and I think that's what makes anthropologists so excited about doing anthropology. And I, again, I would encourage you to please continue with it. 
because it's really um, a great way of going through life. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely, Karen. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Karen. Um, Yost, um, there was um, something for you. Oh, I don't know if you want to say something before we close. I, I don't know what was for me, but... Um, uh, I think you responded. Guess, it was precious. But I mean, if you want to say something in closing, um, you can... Oh, let me just say, it's it's nice to, to take part in the seminar. I think it's a great initiative. And it's great to see all this enthusiasm. And it's also really interesting to see what people are doing with their anthropology out in the real world. I mean, I think uh, some of us caught up in university life sometimes lose touch with what goes on out there. And um, it's really in interesting and encouraging to see how anthropology is clearly such an important force in, in people's working lives and their everyday lives out there. It's really refreshing and encouraging. Great stuff. Uh, thank you so much, Just OK, um, just to close us off, I want to say thank you, um, first of all, um, to our panelists, um, for um, everyone who is here responded enthusiastically to the invite. There was no one who's like, I'm not sure. I don't know what to say. Um, everyone was as passionate as in um, today. So I thank you. Um, thank you all for your for your for your kind enthusiasm and your generosity. I love what's happening in the comments. Um, you all sharing your resources, um, your emails and contacts. Um, I think it's really, really fantastic. I think one of the big things um, that's come up from this conversation is that this conversation is actually an opener um, rather than closes us because we can already see from the things that are emerging that there's quite a lot of work, particularly around communicating anthropology and not just students, but even ourselves um, as practitioners um, really being able to expose students to a diverse um, um, realm of what um, um, anthropology can present in terms of possibilities. Um, so I really thank you all. I think it was very rich. I've taken a lot of notes and already I have ideas um, just based on the comments and the discussions around, you know, the hunger that people have. I mean, at the peak um, of the of the of, of of the panel, we had about 35 people in attendance. And I've shared with some of the people in the uh, in the anthropology group that you know we've had over thirty thousand views on, on our t on our Twitter account within a space of just like you know over a month. So I think young people are hungry for these conversations. And they're hungry to learn um, about what anthropology for them can mean in the world. Of course, some of them might want to be academics, but as we can see, um, the range of possibilities is quite wide. And I think this conversation was a really important starter. Um, in moving us um, um, to, towards thinking about what we can do, particularly in these challenging times with, um, with anthropology in the world. And just to close us off, I just want to plug next week, um, we have a student-led panel um, that's going to be reflecting in some ways actually on a lot of these questions that we've asked um, around the future of um, anthropology and what anthropology in 2020, anthropological research in 2020 um, and in the future will has meant or certainly will mean um, and so I'm quite excited for that. So if you have time, um, the poster should be out um, tomorrow on our social media channels. Um, but other than that, um, it's, it, that's it for me. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, um, I don't take your time um, quite li lightly. Um, we had a really great night and a really great and rich um, discussion. So um, that's it for me. I'm going to end the session. Have a great um, um um, Thursday and and Poza Thursday for those who drink and um, um, <laughs> hope... <laughs> 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 let's have a, a proper how take anthropology Poza Thursday once we can all gather um, um, <laughs> um, have a great weekend everyone um, cheers thank you thanks bye bye bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Cheers.